Okay, open your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Chapter 8, if you don't have a Bible with you and you want to grab the one that's in that rack right in front of you, if you turn to page 557, that is where you will find Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And if you're a guest with us, we always start uh, these messages by letting you know that we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Inerrant in the original manuscript, sovereignly preserved for us through the generations, we believe that through the reading of this book and the illumination of his spirit, we can know God, and we can follow him, and we can worship him, and we can represent him, and and we believe so much in the sufficiency, sufficiency of scripture, we really don't think that what I'm about to say matters at all, unless it agrees with what God has said in his word. We want to collectively be a church that believes it does not matter what I think, What matters is what the Bible says. So what the Bible says needs to become what we think. And that's why we want you to see God's word for yourself today in Ecclesiastes. It's our eighth week in this book that's part of the wisdom literature of Scripture. And our purpose for going through this, uh, this, this book that deals with frustrating realities of life, is that our faith in God would be even greater than our frustrations in life, even though life often doesn't go the way we plan or would prefer. So Solomon's pretty honest about what life can be like. Ecclesiastes reads as a one out of five star review on life a lot of the time, even though if anyone should have enjoyed what life has to offer, it would have been Solomon. I mean, Solomon experienced the best of everything life has and it still wasn't enough. Everything, he says over and over again, is vanity. The Hebrew word is hevel. 38 times he uses that word. And, and he's not saying that it's meaningless when he says it's vanity. He, he's saying that life is a vapor. It's an enigma. It's hard to find anything that you can really hold on to under the sun. And, and one example of that, according to Solomon, is wisdom itself. Gaining true wisdom for life is quite elusive, Solomon would argue. This is how he actually starts chapter 8. Look at verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 8. Solomon says, Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. And, And so this chapter begins with two rhetorical questions. Who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? And many believe the answer Solomon is implying is no one. No one does. Uh, But given that the second half of this verse is actually quite positive in talking about the benefits of wisdom, it makes a man's face to shine. I, I, I believe what Solomon is saying when he asks the question, who's like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? Not many people do. Not Not many. It's, 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 not, it's not very common, right? And, and, and this, is, this is serving as the transition from chapter 7, which we covered last week, to chapter 8. So chapter 7, we saw all these comparisons that were telling us how to have a better life, and, and some of them are surprising, right? The house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. The end of something is better than its beginning. Relying on God's sovereignty is better than relying on earthly perfection, So the message that we were seeing is that a better life is available to us, but it is different. It it is different than we think. Uh, It's different than we think. So some people say that common sense isn't very common, right? And I would submit Solomon is arguing that true wisdom isn't common. In fact, it is rare. Uh, One hobby I got from my father uh, was collecting baseball cards. Any of you still collect baseball cards, sports cards at all? Maybe? Not sure? Okay. My collection is still in my parents' basement, actually, so sorry about that, Mom. I apologize. Um, but, but one thing that determines the value of sports cards, or really any collectible, is how rare it is. Right? It's rarity. How hard is it to get your hands on it? So if only 100 of these were made, or only 50 of these were made, it's, it's worth more because it's limited edition. And And I would suggest that's what Solomon is saying about wisdom, that truly wise people are in short supply. It's a rare find. But if you acquire wisdom for yourself, 
the result is life-changing. Man's wisdom makes his face to shine. And so this is providing some balance to what we saw earlier in the book. Because Solomon had said that with much wisdom, there is much vexation. That he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So on the one hand, it is true at times that ignorance is bliss. Right? We, we talked about that. Right? But does that mean that it is best to just bury our heads in the sand and to ignore truth and, and just enjoy our ignorance? No. No. If everything we have learned in this earthly life only makes our faces angry, then something is wrong. True wisdom leads to joy. Your face will shine. There's significant benefits to being wise. And so the rest of this chapter is going to argue that true wisdom both enjoys its benefits and accepts its limitations because it's a limited, limited edition. So let's look at this next section of verses, verses 2 through 9. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. So we're going to see the benefits and the limitations of wisdom as it relates to submitting to both earthly authorities and then ultimately to God's authority. So starting with submitting to earthly authority, Solomon starts there. And he says, Solomon says, verse 2, I say, keep the king's command. And the skeptic in me responds, of course you say that, Solomon. You're the king. Right? <laughs> so it's a little self-serving, feels like a little bit, right? Of course, so the king is telling us to keep the king's command. Uh, But the argument being made is that submitting to earthly authorities is wise and it is beneficial. And the first reason is given in verse 2. We obey authorities because of God's oath to them. So for followers of Jesus, the main reason we obey earthly authorities is a theological reason. It is based on what we believe about God. So because we believe that God is sovereign over earthly authorities, Romans 13 tells us that every authority is placed in that position by God. So we can disagree with earthly authorities. We can question why someone was placed in that position. We do that all the time. But we can't question who ultimately placed them in that position. So we would be wise not to discount someone's authority so quickly, considering the one who placed them in that position. Which is different than saying that we just blindly follow them, because we do have a higher authority, the one who has placed earthly authorities in their place. We must obey God rather than men when forced to choose. But we should take verse 3 to heart, which tells us not to be hasty to go from an authority's presence which is essentially saying a sign of disrespecting them. And and parents, you experience this frustration with your children. Have you ever had a child walk away from you while you're still talking to them, parents? Doesn't that just fill you with joy and gladness? You know, just what a wonderful day it is? No, not at all, right? Uh, My my kids would never walk away while I'm talking to them, especially not on Father's Day. No, never. Uh, so, So what do we say when that happens? Don't walk away from me while I'm talking to you, right? That's the universal response to that situation. Don't walk away while I'm talking to you because the act of walking away is a visual picture of not respecting or valuing the position of authority, right? That authoritative position. Uh, We we see the benefits of having wisdom in verse 5. Solomon says, whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. That's the general rule. It is wise to obey those who are in authority over us. That's the general rule. 
And it's natural to ask the question about the exceptions, right? But what if the authority tells us to do this? Or what if they tell us to do that? And it's totally fair to have those conversations, right? At what point does an authority need to be opposed? But don't let the exceptions drown out that standard general rule, which is what I think happens a lot. We just focus so much on the exceptions that we miss the main point. The general rule says it is wise to obey those who are in authority over us. And the rest of verse 5, I would say, speaks to the exceptions to that rule. Because Solomon says, the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. So there is a time to speak out, but it is wise to choose your battles carefully. Uh, Some of you pick every single battle. Right? You, you've never found a battle that you don't like. You wake up with your armor on and ready to go, and you should probably stop doing that. I spent a long time thinking of an eloquent way to say it. And can't you tell? Right? Stop it. <laughs> right? Just don't do that. Don't do that. That's what the Bible tells us. Stop doing that. Uh, but even while talking about the benefits of wisdom and how it's beneficial to obey those that are in authority over us and don't be quick to go from their presence, have, a, have an attitude of honor and respect. Even while it's talking about the benefits of that, Solomon also acknowledges the limitations in this paragraph. So verse 7, trouble lies heavy on us because we don't know what is to be. So no matter how wise we are, we don't know what today or tomorrow will ultimately bring. We can't See the future. Our plans get disrupted, disrupted all the time. Verse 8, no one, no matter how powerful, has the power to retain the spirit or the power over the day of death. So we can't escape our own mortality, as we talked about last week. No matter how wise we might become, death is the great equalizer throughout this book. Verse 9, what had Solomon, a person in a position of power, observed throughout his life? That man had power over man to his hurt. So Solomon had all the wisdom in the world, and he couldn't solve this problem. All the wisdom in the world doesn't negate the fact that power often leads to corruption. Those in positions of authority often use that power to hurt those who are under them rather than help them. And that doesn't excuse it. right? We call it out that this world is broken. Which is why I'm thankful that we have a greater, better authority than our earthly authorities. Which is where Solomon finds his solace, even while viewing the atrocities that are done in this very broken world. That's what he moves to in in verse 10. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear God before God. You see the shift in this passage from focusing on earthly authorities to focusing on a heavenly one, right? He focuses on, he, he's, he changes his focus to talking about honoring the king, right? And, and dealing with the issues of people that are in power in earthly positions to ultimately submitting to God's authority. And, and here's one of the benefits of true wisdom that we see in that paragraph. True wisdom is able to see the bigger picture beyond the disorienting present reality. Because when justice is delayed and evil people seem to prolong their life by doing evil, the gut instinct might be to say, well, what does anything matter then? What What does it matter? What's the point? If everyone else is doing it and getting away with it, I might as well do it too. That's why everyone goes 65 miles an hour on 22. Right? Everyone else is doing it. I'm going to get killed if I go the speed limit. Right? That's what we think. And, and if you like to write in your Bible, you need to circle a three-letter word in the middle of verse 12. The word yet. Yet. 
He's talking about all the evil and how justice is delayed and how wicked people seem to prolong their life through wickedness. Yet, despite how it looks right now, despite the wicked appearing to prosper, despite the nice guys appearing to finish last, despite my good deeds always seeming to be punished, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God. Do you know that? Do you know that? Because your confidence in that truth claim is going to be tested over and over again. Because true wisdom does not lead to immediate gratification. It doesn't promise instantaneous results. Your resolve will be tested. There will be times when you will feel like it's not working. Right? And you question whether anything really matters in this vain life. And you, and you feel like you try to do the right thing and nobody cares. Any of you ever feel that way? Right? I'm trying my best and no one seems to care. And life appears better for the people who are taking all the shortcuts. Do you know? Do you know that it will be well with those who fear God? Whether you give up or keep going will ultimately be determined by whether you believe the principle of this verse. And did you notice why it will be well with those who fear God? Solomon says it will be well with those who fear God because they fear God. Oh, well, that explains it so nicely, Solomon. Thank you. And I would say, actually, it does explain it. Solomon is saying that there is a direct connection between fearing God and a better, more fulfilling life in the long run. There's a direct connection, right? This is not an indirect result or a, or a long chain reaction. There's a direct connection because the fear of the Lord, between the fear of the Lord and it ultimately being well with you in the long run. It is always best to submit to the authority of our heavenly king without exception. So there are exceptions to the rule of obeying earthly authorities. There is zero exceptions given here. And we try to find exceptions. We try to make ourselves the exception to this rule, right? We always view our own situation as unique in some way to give us license to do what we really want, regardless of what God's word says. But no, no, no. Submitting to the authority of the Lord is always best. No exceptions. And on the other side of the exact same coin, Solomon says, it will not be well with the wicked verse 13, simply because they do not fear the Lord. And by the way, he says, they don't actually prolong their lives either because God numbered each of our days before time even began. And, and so I just view this paragraph as one that can be so comforting or so terrifying. Because on the one hand, it's, it's, the application's really simple. Fear God. Submit to his authority. Leave the rest of the results to him, right? It's the conclusion of the entire book of Ecclesiastes as well. Once we get to chapter 12, it's not that complicated. But if you don't, if you reject his authority, if you live for yourself, it is not going to end well for you. And many of you could testify to the times that you tried to do it yourself. And it didn't end well, did it? It didn't work out. It didn't end well. And, and you might tell yourself that it's not a big deal. And you might think, well, everyone else is doing it, so how wrong could it be? And, and people equate delays in justice to the absence of justice. That's what verse 12 is telling us. Even from an earthly perspective, justice is not executed quickly. Right? So crimes take years to get to trial, and then there are appeals, and then there's injunctions, and those delays often serve to embolden people to think they can get away with it. Right? They can beat the system. And the same principle plays out from an ultimate perspective. Because God does not punish all of our sins immediately. 
which is great news, by the way. We don't need all those lightning bolts coming down on a regular basis. That would be really bad for us if it was swift justice right away. That would be terrible. But don't confuse God's patience for his indifference. Everyone else is doing it does not mean it will end well for everyone else. And and so people that try to present God in the Old Testament as like super temperamental and ready to pop off at any moment, I, I would say that's primarily because we don't realize the decades and generations of time that are passing as we read through the pages of the Old Testament. God has always been gracious. God has always been slow to anger. God has always been abounding, rich in love. But if you ever start to question his justice, if you feel like he is indifferent towards sin, and God, don't you see what's happening, and how could this be, right? All you have to do is look to the cross. Because when you look at the cross, you are seeing God's just wrath for man's words, thoughts, and actions that are not in submission to his ultimate authority. When you see Jesus suffering on the cross, you are seeing the suffering that we deserved that I deserve for my rebellion against God's rule and reign. So the gospel doesn't tell us that it's okay, God loves you, and God's indifferent to your sin against him. No, the gospel tells us that what we have earned because of our sin is death. Separation from God both now and forever. But Jesus... God himself died the death that we deserve to die. His blood poured out on the cross as the sufficient for all payment for the debt that we owed but could never afford to pay on our own. And then Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered sin and the grave. So if you come to the end of yourself, if you can recognize that you will never be good enough to meet his ultimate standard and, 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 and to live up to his righteousness and, and, and you can never meet the standard of the one that has ultimate authority and you place your faith instead in the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus. If you come to him and you just say, Jesus, I need you to be the king of my life. All your sins are forgiven. The righteousness of Jesus is credited to your account. You become part of the eternal kingdom of God. It will be well now and forever for those who fear God. Do you know that? Do you really know that? No matter what's going on around you, no matter how disorienting present events may be, do you know that this truth has not changed? Wisdom does not mistake patience for indifference, and it doesn't mistake grace for license. And we see more of the benefits to the wisdom of fearing God in the next paragraph, verses 14 and 15. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And I commend joy, for a man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So once again, as Solomon has lamented throughout the book, he's saying in verse 14, bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people from a under the sun, limited time bound perspective. And if, did, you, did you feel as I was reading verses 14 and 15 that those two verses don't go together at all? Right? Those, they don't seem like they go together. Verse 14 is about how upside down and unfair the world is. Right? The, the bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people and what in the world is this? It's all vanity. And then verse 15 says we should enjoy life. Right? And you might think that and read, is that a joke? Like, how, how in the world are verses 14 and 15 right next to each other in the Bible? How can you enjoy life, eat and drink, when there is so much evil and injustice going on around you? Right? Our natural inclination is to think that verse 15 is only possible when verse 14 has been dealt with. 
But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that true wisdom enables us to accept that not all wrongs have been made right yet. Yet. There is a time and a place for everything. And if you wait until everything is perfect to enjoy God's good gifts under the sun, you will never be able to enjoy them. And some of you need to hear that again. If you wait until everything is perfect under the sun to enjoy God's good gifts, you will never enjoy them. And embracing the sovereign, ultimate authority of God sets us free to enjoy life's good things. Even when things aren't perfect and even when things are messed up, we can enjoy life's good things because there's lots of good things. Enjoy those steaks on the grill today, Dad. Enjoy them. Enjoy the U.S. Open and cheer for Ricky Fowler with me if golf is your thing, right? Enjoy mowing the lawn now that it's finally rained. Did any of you enjoy the rain this week? I mean, I celebrated the rain this week because I'm old and, you know, I'm excited about the weather all of a sudden. I celebrated the rain. Did the rain coming day after day, did that, did that mean that everything in life was solved? No, but it was a good gift. It was a good, it was a good gift. It was a good thing. Enjoy hiking in nature, right? Enjoy the wedding. Enjoy working on your car. Enjoy the kids and the grandkids' sporting events. Watch some fireworks and celebrate our nation's independence on July 4th. Does that mean that our country is perfect? Of course it isn't. But freedom is a good thing to celebrate. If we wait until everything is perfect to enjoy God's good gifts under the sun, we'll never enjoy them. So this is not, let's eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. This is not fatalistic. This is the freedom that can be found when we realize that we are not the center of the universe. The world doesn't revolve around us. It's not our job to fix everything. If something or someone has to be perfect in order to be celebrated, then we have nothing under the sun to celebrate. So we worship the one who's perfect, right? We sing Christ exalted over all, right? We behold our God who is seated on the throne and submitting to his authority enables us to celebrate and to enjoy his good gifts despite, despite their flaws under the sun. Let's look at verse 16 and 17. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one eye sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. So we have the limitations of wisdom. You can work day and night, and you can apply all your time to try to figure out what in the world God is doing in the world. And you're not going to be able to figure it all out. Some people are going to claim to know. I cracked the code. They don't know either, Solomon says. God is so other. He is so unlike us, right? He is so beyond our understanding, limited by time and space. It is impossible for us to understand how everything is working together. It just doesn't make sense at times. And for some of you, that reality has completely stolen your joy. You are just frustrated with God because you don't like how he seems to be operating and you're anxious or you're restless or you're angry or you're depressed or you, maybe you're a little bit of all of those things. And Solomon's argument seems to be that the limitations of our wisdom don't prevent us from enjoying life because figuring everything out isn't a prerequisite. Fearing God Submitting to him, trusting in him to be sovereign over what we don't understand is the prerequisite for experiencing true joy. Because true wisdom enjoys its benefits and accepts its limitations. In fact, we could probably say that true wisdom enjoys its benefits because it accepts its limitations. 
because it accepts its limitations. I don't have to know everything. I don't have to solve everything. I'm not in charge. And so I trust, and I fear, and I submit to the one who is, and I find so much joy and so much freedom right there, right there. And, and I trust that you're thinking about all sorts of applications right now. Uh, I trust you because, man, there are so many applications to Ecclesiastes 8 and especially the end of it to our daily lives. But let me just finish by applying this to dads in light of today. Dads, if we want to show our families how to be wise, we will be an example of submitting to authority. When forced to choose, we will obey God rather than men. We will encourage a long-term view of God's working rather than being captives to the moment. We will believe that it will be well for those who fear God. And then we will enjoy life's good gifts because our faith enables us to accept what we don't know because our faith in God is greater than our frustrations in life. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that the song that we are about to sing will be true, that we will be able to lift you high, even in the lowest valley, that we will choose to praise and to glorify the name that is above all names. Because of everything that we know, everything that you have revealed about yourself to us has shown us that we can trust you for what we don't know too. And I pray that we would see that joy in life doesn't come from figuring everything out, but it comes from trusting and submitting to the one who has everything figured out. So I pray that we would enjoy your good gifts and they would point to us to worship the giver of those good gifts, that you would be the object of our worship, and that no matter what comes this week, we don't know what it will bring, but we will praise you for who you are and what you're doing, even when we don't understand. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.